Good morning, bon dia, buenos dias, and welcome to the Smart City Expo World Congress. It is day three in the auditorium. I'm your host, Ramel London, and I'm about to introduce our first keynote speaker of the morning. He is Mr. Rufus Pollock, a researcher, technologi technologist, and entrepreneur. Rufus is the founder and president of the international nonprofit Op Open Knowledge. Formerly the Mead Fellow in Economics at Emmanuel College, University of Cambridge, he is the recipient of a $1 million Shuttleworth Fellowship. He also has a brand new book, Open Revolution, which will be available for a signed copy, so you can speak to him about it afterwards. But first, he will be speaking on a robot revolution for the 1%. So please welcome Mr. Rufus Pollock. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, I want to start very briefly just by thanking you, thanking the organizers for inviting me here, and thank you for being here. Um, I really uh, appreciate your time and attention, and I'm really going to make the best use of them in the next 25 minutes. So thank you, and thank you for coming here today. So I want to talk about what's different I want to begin by talking about what's different about the digital world. So I want to just take a moment. I want you to sit there in your seat for a moment, for a second, and just think. And we don't know have a microphone. It's not going to be interactive. Maybe people could shout out from around the room. But I just want to ask, what's different about the digital age? What is it that's different? Just shout out if you have an idea. Just shout it out. Connected, someone is connected, yeah, what else? It's fast, it's, it's rapid, anything else? Real time, it's real time, yes, what else? Feedback loops, there are feedback loops, that's what's different, there weren't feedback loops in the same way in the past, but now there are. What else? It's fun, is that what you said? Fun. The world, it wasn't so fun any, in the past. Now it's fun. Now we have Netflix. Okay. What else? What else? Accessibility. It's more accessible than it was in the past. You can go online. You can find things. Yep, absolutely. No time to think. Yeah, there's a downside as well. It's not just all good, right? There's no time to think in the digital age. That's what's different. You know, in the old times, you know, we had time for our family, for our friends. Now we're just on our phones the whole time. Yeah, that's something that's different, maybe. What else? Anything else that comes to people? Just sit in your seat, even for yourself, and just think. If someone asks you, what's the one single biggest thing that is different about the digital age? The one thing, you're only going to say one thing, what would it be that was different? Social pressure, someone says. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to let you think on that for a moment because what I'm going to talk to you today, I'm going to talk to you about the biggest single change, actually probably in, potentially in, in all of human economic history and its implications. And it's just incredible you're here because you're here and we're here at a time when we're actually present and aware, kind of conscious about what we're living through. Like 10,000 years ago, roughly, mankind kind of created settled agriculture, right? We went from being nomads to having wheat and corn and animals. And that was the, like, that's what gave birth to modern cities and civilization. But people probably weren't aware. You didn't have people sitting around in their caves going, you know what? We're going through a revolution. Do you realize that? You know, we're domesticating animals. It wasn't conscious. But right now, we're conscious of the single biggest potential change in human economic history. Because there is a profound and simple shift. And none of you have actually said it yet. And one thing I think should be the case is that whenever I say, what is the single biggest shift 
in a digital world, there is one clear, simple answer. And to find it out, I'm going to play a game with you. You didn't realize how interactive this session was, did you? OK, I don't have, anything, I don't have any magical technology. You're just going to have to put your hands up. So what I want to ask you is, what is the odd one out? Right? We have a banana. We have a movie. You could think of it as Netflix or old style DVDs. And we have a, a medicine, a pill for cancer or for headaches or whatever. Now, I want you to say, who thinks the banana is the odd one out? Just put your hand up. Do this quickly. Who thinks the banana? Everyone has to put their hand up at least once, OK? Who thinks it's the banana? OK, a good set of people out there. Who thinks it's the movie that's the special one? Great. And who thinks it's the medicine? OK, a lot of people didn't vote there, but I'm not going to. We got it, OK? Now, the odd one out is the banana. Why is that? Because the banana is basically made of atoms, and the other two are made of bits. A movie is actually made of bits. Even if it comes on a DVD, the DVD costs almost nothing. All of the value, all of the stuff in a DVD is the bits. Now, that, the medicine, it might not be so obvious, but it's also true of a medicine. When you, get, when you get that pill, most of the stuff in the pill is kind of the invisible information, the design of the drug, not the actual chemicals that have been manufactured. OK? That's what really is the value and cost of a medicine is in its information. But a banana, that's not, unless it's a genetically modified banana, that's not the case for the banana. Now, what is so, one thing about the digital age, which is I, the kind of basic point, is that more and more of the value that gets produced in the digital age is in, the, is in information. And by the way, that has been going on for some time, maybe hundreds of years. Ever since we invented language and writing, information has been playing a bigger role in human societies. But obviously, it's the computer, the internet, the mobile phone. Suddenly, this has accelerated. And just to give you a sense how recently it is, it's estimated it was about a decade ago that in developed countries like Spain or the United States or Western Europe, investment in information production, making knowledge, overtook spending on physical things like roads or steel factories. Now, that's the not the actual biggest shift. The biggest shift is this question. How much does it cost to make another banana once I've got one banana? Let's say the banana costs a euro. How much does the second banana cost? A euro. Yeah, a euro. Now, once I've got one copy, how much does the first copy of the movie cost? Maybe 100 million dollars, 100 million euros for the first copy. How much does the second copy of the movie cost once I've got the master? Nothing. One cent, if you're really being generous on what it costs to do bandwidth transfer. What about the medicine? The medicine maybe costs a billion dollars to come up with, to come up with a new cancer drug. How much does it cost to actually manufacture the pill? Maybe a dollar. Now. That is a profound shift in the nature of something. You go from goods where it costs the same amount to make more. Once I've got one house, I cannot click my fingers to have a house for everyone on the planet. If I have one Ferrari, I cannot click my fingers and have a Ferrari for everyone on the planet. But I can click my fingers, basically, and have a copy of Gangnam's, Gangnam Style for everyone on the planet. I don't know if you've gone and checked the stats recently, but if you know what I mean by Gangnam Style, the most watched video of all time on YouTube, it is closing on on one view for every person on the planet. That is the single profound shift in the nature of the digital age. We've gone from atoms to bits, and bits are costlessly copyable. They are non-rival in economics terminology. Now, that means movies are different from shoes in a fundamental way. If I'm wearing my shoes, you can't wear them at the same time. It's just fact of the physical world. But if I've got an idea, I can share it with a million people. If I've got a movie, I can share it with the whole planet. That is the fundamental change. Now, that is the single profound shift that when someone says you what's different about the digital age, you say, 
costless copying. You want to try that? What's different about the digital age? Costless copying. It is the single biggest shift in the nature of the economy and production in all human history. Because it's a world by default of abundance. And bits, now, this changes everything. Now, let me illustrate that. I want to make a little joke. First of all, like, I hope you get my, it isn't a typo, but the plate tectonics of the digital age. So people know about there's these plates underneath the ocean. And so imagine for thousands of years, humans are like, why do earthquakes happen? Why do volcanoes happen? We have stories about gods and about monsters or about some other stuff. And then one day someone says, you know what, there's just, you know, like, Africa looks like it fits together with South America. And there are these plates moving around, and they go, for about 50 years they go, no, that's rubbish, that's crazy. And then they go, no, that's actually correct. And guess what? It allows you to therefore predict where earthquakes are going to happen. Maybe not when, but where. Suddenly you have a very simple basic model. It's somewhat hidden that explains these massive phenomena. Now what I'm about to do is take one phenomena and explain it how it connects to costless digital copying. So, and it's the rise of populism. All over the world right now, there is a rise in populism. Whether you think it's good or bad, I'm not interested in. I just want to explain one of the most seismic shifts in politics in the last half century, potentially, certainly the last 30 years. Trump, Bolsonaro, Brexit, Whatever you think of them, it's clear that something is going on. And it's going on in cities, and it's going on in countries. So I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you about Mr. Frisbee and the American dream. Because all good talk should have a story. Now, Mr. Frisbee, despite his name, is actually a real man. Okay, He was born in 1963 in Florida. And when he was 15 year old, years old, he left high school and he went to work in an agricultural machinery business just south of Tampa. And he worked there for the next 30 years. And then one day he took all of the savings he'd made and he fulfilled his dream. He started his own business. And it was a scrapyard and metalworking workshop. And believe it or not, you know what he called his business? He called it American Dream Welding and Fabrication. Now, you couldn't have had a better name, right? Because in his world, in his lifetime, his version of the American dream is disintegrating. It definitely needs some welding, right? The world he grew up, the jobs he grew up in, the blue-collar industrial sector in the United States is collapsing and disappearing. And when the recession comes in 2009, he is really struggling. He has to fire most of his staff, and it's just him and his stepson. His wife gets fired from her job at a daycare center, and he starts to get angry. He starts to resent other people's success. Because they're doing okay. Why are they okay and he's not? Because his world is not working. And then we come to 2016, two years ago. He's angry. He's dispossessed. The government are making him put up some stupid fence around his business that's costing him $100,000. And he's going to someone who is going to vote for Donald Trump. He's going to vote for someone who is at least giving him some kind of answer, however true or not it is. And the thing I want you to look at is that he may be one man, but he represents millions. The bottom 60% of Americans, that's 180 million people, have barely seen their real, their real incomes rise since 1970. That's nearly 50 years. Those same 180 million Americans are actually poorer in 2016 when they go to vote than they were in 1999. They've actually got poorer in real terms. And that has never happened before in the history of the United States. Meanwhile, the share of the richest people, the share of the 1%, the top 5% has risen dramatically. And that's what takes it so tough for people like Mr. Frisbee. If everyone was struggling, maybe you'd understand. But when you watch a few people get at the top making it, getting rich, and you're struggling, then you get angry. And the thing is, it's no longer Mr. Frisbee, the blue-collar guy. It's people in the middle classes. 
who are really struggling, who worry about their jobs, who worry about job security, will worry if their job will get outsourced offshore and whether they will still be needed. And if you think this is just America, don't, it's not. So there's a direct connection between the growing inequality and the political instability we are seeing today. And this isn't just about the US. This growing inequality is happening all over the world. You look at China, which is definitely benefiting massively from economic growth, but inequality has massively risen. They estimate in the next 10 years, most people at Foxconn, which build your mobile phone, their job will get replaced with a robot. Now, we need to ask ourselves what's causing that growing inequality. What's behind this and what can we do about it? Because it is systematic. And what I want you to see today is that there is a direct connection between the rise of digital technology and this growing inequality and political instability. Now, this may sound surprising. After all, digital technology has brought us incredible innovation and progress. And it isn't digital technology on its own that is causing growing inequality. Rather, it's the combination of digital technology's costless copying with the mistaken and inappropriate use of old rules of exclusive ownership in the form of patents and copyrights that is causing growing inequality and political instability. To think of an analogy just for yourself right now, I don't know if you know, people remember the Oklahoma bombing in the United States in which 140 people died. Timothy McVeigh, a guy who believed in small government <laughs> or no government, blew up a, uh, a building in Oklahoma City about 20 years ago. Now, what did he use to do that? He used ammonium nitrate, if you know what that is. That is fertilizer. I grew up on a farm. We spray ammonium uh, nitrate on the field. It's nitrogen because it helps the plants grow. Now, you can think of cost as copying is like that. It's actually this amazing stuff that can accelerate innovation, progress, wealth. But what did Timothy McVeigh do? He combined ammonium nitrate with another substance. And when you put that together, you can make an explosive, you can make a bomb. And what we're doing right now is we're combining costless copying, which is amazing, which is like nitrogen. We need it to grow everything. It's fantastic. But we're combining it with exclusive rules of ownership, and it's creating something bomb-like, in a sense, political and economic sense. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. So to understand, let's step back for a moment. We talked about Mr. Frisbee's lifetime and how it coincides with the decline of traditional US industry, how he sees his jobs disappear and he becomes one of the dispossessed. But at the same time, in his exact lifetime, we see the rise of the modern information economy. Intel is founded in 1968 when Mr. Frisbee is five. When he is 12, in 1975, Bill Gates will drop out of Harvard to found Microsoft. And one year later, Apple will get started in a garage in Silicon Valley. Now, you might sit here and say, there's always been change, Rufus. I mean, horses got replaced by motor cars. People who had horse businesses, they went out of business. Mr. Frisbee's just in a horse business. It's just, it's not great, it's not nice, but it's what's gone on since we had Luddites in the, ni the 19th century. That's how economic progress works. That's how innovation happens. And you would be right. I totally agree. And there will sometimes be winners and losers. But in a market, but there's something different. Because when Mr. Frisbee's job goes, he's replaced not by somebody else, but by a robot. Now, what's different about that, you might ask? Because, you know, motor cars replace horses, but people still need to build motor cars. And maybe people still need to build robots. There is something fundamentally different. To see that, I want to think of an analogy. Imagine for a moment that the economy is like a running race. And there are different kinds of running race. For example, at my school, we had a running race where anyone who finished the race in under two hours was a winner. It, it was a cross-country race, and if you finished in time, you won. Now, that's what the old economy was like. Think about it. Imagine you're a farmer and you grow apples. Sure, there are some farmers who are better and some who are worse. But everyone who does an OK job growing apples and picking them makes a living. 
Yeah, now, but let's say you make a, you're in a car factory and you work on the car there. So maybe some people are faster at building cars, maybe some people are slower, but if you do a decent job in the car factory, you will have a living. You can support your family, you have a decent life. And even if you own the car factory, yeah, there are other car factories that are competing with you, but if you run your car factory well as a capitalist, you'll make a living, you'll make money. That's a decent free market economy working right there. But what happened is we got a shift to an economy that's like a race where there's just one winner. It's all about who comes first. If you win that race, you get all the prize money, all the value, and everyone else, it doesn't matter where you came. Now, why is that like the digital economy? Because in a digital economy, the fundamental, central, massive change is what? Costless copying. That is the central, massive change. So once I've got one copy of Windows software, guess what? I can make a copy for everyone on the planet. Once I've got one copy of a movie or one copy of a database, I can reproduce it for everyone practically costlessly. So now I've got a situation where one person can supply everyone. Now that's very different. Let's go back to the apple farmer for a minute. There's a limit on how many apples an apple farmer can supply. I told you again, I grew up on a farm, so I'm talking from real experience here, <laughs> right? There's a limit. That means I can farm apples, that man can farm apples, you can farm apples, this lady can farm apples, and if we do a decent job, we all make a living. But suppose that one day there is an apple farmer named Mr. Gates. And Mr. Gates, one night, a witch comes to Mr. Gates' house. And she gives him a magical seed and says, Mr. Gates, if, if you give me 100 gold coins, I will give you the seed and you go plant it and it will produce a magical apple tree. And Mr. Gates does this. He gives her 100 gold coins. He goes and buries the apple seed. And the next day, there's this apple tree that's grown. And from that night onwards, that apple tree produces infinite, as many apples as you want at no cost to Mr. Gates. Suddenly, Mr. Gates can supply everyone with apples that cost him nothing. He can undercut everyone else, and suddenly he will dominate the entire apple market. And that's what's going on. The real world Mr. Gates, once he has the window operating system, he can dominate. He supplies everyone in the world, and it costs him nothing to make each new copy. So he can dominate the market, and that's what we're seeing. These incredible monopolies like Facebook, Google, Windows. In every vertical you look at, Oracle, in every niche you look at, you tend towards monopoly or close to it. Now, there's one really important thing to add to this story. And that's the issue is not just infinite costless copying. It's that a single person has exclusive ownership and control of that. That Mr. Gates, the farmer, has exclusive ownership and control of his magical apple tree. That the real world, Mr. Gates, has Microsoft have exclusive ownership of Windows. That's what's crucial. We could have a fairy story where Mr. Gates' magical apple tree is shared with everyone. Everyone has apples. But no, we have created rules that give people exclusive ownership and control. Now, there's a reason to that. It costs money. It costs money to create the apple tree. It costs money to come up with new software, new databases, new movies. So as a society, we thought, OK, we have to have a way that innovators make their money back. And that's what we've done, is we've given out these monopoly rights, like copyright and patent, that give someone exclusive monopoly control of these pieces of software, these movies, these databases. But there has been this massive unintended side effect. The result of running the new economy on these old rules of exclusive ownership and control is incredible spiraling inequality and stagnating innovation. In 2016, the eight richest people on the planet had as much money as the bottom 50% of humanity. That's three and a half billion people. And of those eight, six of them are tech billionaires. Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Sergey Brin, 
This is an extraordinary, unprecedented concentration of economic wealth and power made possible because these goods are costlessly copyable and exclusively owned. And this creates this incredible anger for Mr. Frisbee. He sees his job disappear, and he does not know why. He sees the few getting rich, and he does not know why. And he gets angry and resentful. And it is this inequality driven by the information economy, running on old rules of exclusive ownership, that is the motor of the greatest political shifts of our time. I said it is the plate tectonics. Once you get costless copying and you understand what it does when you combine it with exclusive rights, you can understand much of what's going on in the economy and much of what's going on in politics. It is being driven by people like Mr. Frisbee who are angry and dispossessed, and understandably so, who are not getting new jobs in this new economy, but are simply getting replaced by Mr. Bezos and now have nothing left. Now, if that was all I had to say, it would just be a rant against the robots. But it's completely the opposite of actually what I want to leave you with. Because once we have cost as copying, we have the potential of abundance. We have the capacity to give knowledge to everyone. It's like we had a world in which the story in which Jesus saw, s shared the loaves and fishes with everyone. Everyone had food miraculously. That actually happens in the digital information world every day. You can miraculously share information at no cost. The thing is we need new rules. We need new rules for this new digital economy. Taking the old rules of the physical economy, of atoms, of shoes, and applying them in the new world of bits doesn't work. Old property, old property rights that we created for the old world, they work. They're really great. But intellectual property doesn't work. In this new world, intellectual property is actually intellectual monopoly. So we need to create new rules that allow for sharing, for cost of copying, and for creators to get paid. Now, what I'm here to say is that better world is possible. We've got stuck in our old world thinking, stuck in thinking that bits are like bread, but they're not. They're different. And if we're willing to innovate, to create new rules, rules based on openness and remuneration rights, we can restore free enterprise, we can restore free markets, and make a world where everyone has a chance and everyone has a choice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pollock. Okay, we have an opportunity, a very, very short opportunity for questions. So if you do have a question, please do step up to one of the microphones. Um, alternatively, I also have questions on the ask and vote system. So I'll give you a moment if anyone wants to come up. There you go. If take, uh, take the microphone, please. Um, please say your name and your question. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Pablo Valerio from Citizens of the Future. Um, I would like to ask you about uh, when you're talking about the concentration of worlds, and especially the tech world, and because of this copy, uh, basically, <coughs> your, your magic word of costless copying. Um, when we're talking about valuation of companies and the way that you know people are rated as the richest people in the world and things like that. In reality, what's happening is that the economy has been growing in a way that that money doesn't even exist. And the, uh, what, I'm thinking, uh, what I'm thinking about is that those people, they decide to share that money or they, they, you change the, the rules of uh, intellectual property and things like that, in a way it will change the markets completely in the way they operate. I don't know if you have a comment on that. Yeah, so I want to say two things at the beginning. First of all, I am really in favor of wealth. So what's different about this, I want people to get, is I'm not talking about redistribution. I've got no interest in like redistributing money around because of inequality in itself. I mean, I want to add, and I've got a short t talk today, in it relatively. The thing that I didn't talk about is that this monopoly is also leading to massive stagnation. Just think for one moment for yourself, the internet, the internet was very special because it was open. Anyone could build on the internet, right? The, there was no intellectual property around how the web worked or how uh, the internet, internet protocols worked. And guess what? That led to the greatest flowering of innovation in human history. 
right? The late 90s, the 2000s, even today, because people, anyone could go on the internet and build a new company. You didn't need to go to AOL or the telephone monopolist to AT&T and ask them for permission, right? You could just start Google. You could just start Amazon. You could just start Facebook. You didn't need to seek permission. And I don't know whether you realize how, now if you want to do the same on Facebook, is that true or do you need permission from Facebook? You need permission from Facebook. Right now, these massive networks, now in a way that gets cloaked for us by the magic of Moore's law and Costa's copying. We're so infatuated by just how fast technology, the base technology moves, that we don't see how kind of uninnovative Facebook is as a platform. I mean, think about what happened on the internet within a few years of the, of the internet taking off in the 90s. And then look at what's got built on Facebook relatively. So the other point I want to emphasize is my big beef here is I don't really care per se about inequality. I care about freedom of enterprise, I care about entrepreneurship, and I care about growth. Now, to answer your question, actually if you look at the amount of money they're making, they are making a huge amount of money. Those companies are extraordinarily profitable. You look at the amount of money Google makes in terms of invest, return on invested capital, it's extraordinary. You look at Facebook, you look at Uber, and we don't even see their numbers. It is incredible profitable being a platform monopolist. Now, I, wanna, didn't, I just want to give a taste also, because people might be wondering, like, what am I suggesting you do? I'm not suggesting take their money away from them. I'm not interested in that at all. I'm just in changing the rules of the game in terms of how we pay for information goods. And I just want you to think about something here. Intellectual property we kind of know is different because like it expires. Even the most fanatical property people go, you know, your patent expires after 20 years. That doesn't happen when you own a house. Or my, my ownership of my shoes does not expire, right? They're mine forever once I bought them. Now, just think of that well-known socialist republic known as the United States of America. Now, I'm saying that, that's a joke, because the, you know that the United States government directly fund half of all medical research and development in the United States. So if you're thinking of information production like steel production, it would be like the United States government paying for half of all steel to be produced by the taxpayer. It would be like, it would be like state plan socialism. Like people would be like, what's going on? But they pay right now for half of all medical R&D, all medical knowledge that's produced in the United States, they directly fund. Now, what I am suggesting, I don't want the government to go directly fund everything directly because that's not maybe efficient. What I want is free enterprise, I want free markets, but I need a way to pay that doesn't involve monopoly rights. Now, I want you to think about, I joke, I think a Spotify model. You pay a subscription fee, and then the money is distributed in a free market-like way to artists based on how much their music is listened to. But it's like an open model. Once you're on Spotify, now Spotify isn't open, but once you're on Spotify and you're a subscriber, you have unlimited access. Now imagine doing Spotify for medicines. We all pay a fee for medical research and development. It gets given out to people who get things that look like patents, but they're called remuneration rights. Their medicine can be manufactured by anyone at cost, so medicines are now very cheap, but the person who's the innovator gets paid from the Spotty Pharma Fund from our subscriptions that we've paid for medical innovation. You could have free enterprise, free markets, and competition, and you have cheap universal access at the same time. And you could do that for the platform economy. You could have cities coming together saying, stop this weird model where we buy proprietary software or proprietary platforms, and we get locked in and ripped off and we can't innovate on our own platforms because the vendor controls us, we could have a model where cities came together and started saying, let's fund a remuneration rights fund for the technologies we need. We'll put money in the fund, we all subscribe as cities using our taxpayer dollars, and then we give the money out, not through grants or some uh, call for proposals, but literally by paying people whose technologies we use if they are open. So every year we go, okay, we use this company's technology. It's open source. We're going to pay them out of this fund automatically. So you start to get the combination of free market entrepreneurship, venture capital, but you have open technologies. Like, okay. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all the time One we question. Have, I got, but unfortunately. We'll finish, yeah. Thank wrap you so it much. Up. Please go and another Come and ask me. And if you want books, yes. I'm outside the door. Come and chat to me. Thank yes, you very thank much. Thank you so much. Rufus Pollock, thank you.